Welcome to the, this forum on academic freedom and political dissent. Good evening. I'm Martin Manlanson. I'm in the Anthropology and Asian American Studies Department, and I'm here to moderate, if you will. There's nothing moderate he, uh, here tonight, uh, but uh, I'll police most of the uh, speakers, <laughs> and not about civility. So it's not all about civility. So let me just explain what the event is and how we will run it. The event is sponsored by the Urbana-Champaign Independent Media Center, a, a grassroots organization committed to media, arts, and technology for social change. The UCIMC is home to the WRFU Radio, the public one uh, newspaper, Makerspace, book to, Books to Prisoners, and a number of local artists. Um, we're grateful to the IMC for allowing us to use this space for tonight's event. And in that spirit, uh, we would like to let you know that they're also accepting donations. So uh, afterwards, please be generous. Um, just a little background about this event. Earlier this year, Professor Frankie was uh, invited to campus by the Intersect Group on Cultures of Law in Global Contexts, coordinated by Professors Xiao Dan, Faisal Mohammed, Chantal Nadeau, Rob Carr, and um, Jason Mazzoni. In response to the firing of Professor Salida, Professor Frankie declined to, uh, decided to boycott the invitation, and she wrote a powerful letter to the Chancellor indicating her reasons. But as a way to do something positive, she offered to pay her own way uh, to come to, from New York to this off-campus event. So we took her up on the offer and organized this conversation in a way to explore the implications of uh, the university's actions and the Board of Trustees' vote last week. Um, thank you, Catherine, for uh, coming tonight and to our panelists and all of you for coming. Um, just a few housekeeping um, items. First one is this, um, event is being so if you don't want yourself recorded or memorialized stay out of the way of the camera um, and you can uh, if you want to ask a question and don't want to be seen you can ask someone else to ask the question for you okay oh just in case you get memorialized by accident so um the other thing too is that there is a graffiti wall right there and it's a way to kind of um, bring, out our, our, uh, bring out your, uh, what do you call this, a depressive idea, uh, depressive feelings, <laughs> anger, incivility, what have you. Please uh, feel free to uh, express yourself. Um, lastly, uh, there's a water fountain right here and uh, bathrooms over there. Um, so tonight, what will happen would be uh, Professor Frankie will speak for about a half hour, followed by a, a brief comments from each of our panelists. So what I'll do is introduce Professor Frankie, and then afterwards, I'll introduce all of the um, panelists in the order they will uh, speak. So let me introduce our speaker today. Catherine M. Frankie is the Isidore and Seville Sulzbacher Professor of Law and the Director of the Center for, for Gender and Sexuality Law at Columbia University. She is a leading scholar of law, religion, and rights, and all of her work is informed by the intersections of feminist, queer, and critical race theory. In addition to her scholarship and teaching, she is actively involved in several organizations, including the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies, and the Center for Nonviolent Education. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Frankie.
I must say the thanks has to go in the other direction. I want to thank all of you for what you've been going through in this last uh, month and a half, two months, in inspiring the rest of us to get engaged with this issue um, and to think hard um, and to think in uncomfortable and certainly uncivil ways um, about the, the kind of threats to the university, the idea of the university and to academic freedom that you are dealing with every day here in connection with P Professor Salida's appointment. Um, uh, but you were dealing with before in your work um, long before this particular issue came up. But I, f I first of all want to thank the, um, the Cultures of Law uh, and Global Context Initiative and the Gender and Women's Studies Departments for inviting me to come because if you hadn't invited me, then I couldn't have boycotted the invitation. <laughs> Um, and then come in this way. So in, in, in many ways, this is a lot more fun. Um, and it's taken a lot more work <laughs> to, to visit you in this capacity rather than in the official capacity that I had anticipated. So I, uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm, ba I'm thrilled to be back in the land of Lincoln. Um, I grew up outside Chicago. Uh, many generations of both sides of my family are from Springfield. And driving down from Midway uh, this afternoon with the corn and soybean fields on either side of the road reminded me of many, many visits to see my grandparents in, uh, in Springfield. And so it was, a, it was a very fond sort of coming home to be here. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here for a whole range of reasons, but one of, one of which is quite personal. So, um, uh, and, and lastly, I want to thank the Independent Media Center again for I know you've been thanked already, but we can't thank you enough for this incredibly cool space. Um, I'm interested in, in knowing more about what you do here. I'm sad to report that there's nothing like this at Columbia, um, and it's to Columbia's detriment. I'm afraid that, that we don't have cool spaces like this. So, um, so I'm here sort of by accident, and, and tragically by accident, but delightfully so, um, and I'm here um, to stand with you, to stand with you in outrage, and in outrage at the assault on academic freedom that Professor Salida's termination represents. I'm also here to help frame some of the issues that are at stake in the case at this moment, at this pivotal moment, um, after the Board of Trustees have voted. And I'm here to engage this vibrant, um, thrilling really, intellectual community as you find yourselves in the eye of a storm that has touched almost every one of our campuses across the country. Your struggle is our struggle, and that's why I'm here, and that's why so many other scholars and students and activists around the country, and really around the globe, have stood with you through this, and we will remain with you. You are not alone, although I know it feels isolating being here, particularly with the boycott, but you are not alone. I'm here to tell you that you are not alone also in confronting the work of a very well-financed, well-organized, and powerful set of groups that seek to cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. These are the words of Justice William Brennan, a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. An orthodoxy regarding the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, an orthodoxy regarding the meaning and consequences of certain forms of state violence in the Middle East, and an orthodoxy regarding compact, complex claims of dispossession, belonging, and identity, both here and in the land to be found between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean. This pall of orthodoxy at its core undermines fundamental values of academic freedom, but more than that, it threatens the academic project more generally. So we stand here tonight, myself and my colleagues here, exactly a week after the university, uh, the university's board of trustees voted eight to one not to approve the nomination of Professor Stephen Salida for an appointment with tenure on this outstanding faculty. So what now? What are the longer term implications of the catastrophe that we witnessed in the Board of Trustees, uh, the Trustees Boardroom last week. So I come to this question in three ways, with three hats, and I, I don't know how to wear three hats at once, so I'll shift them in an imaginative way. The first is as a law professor and a civil rights lawyer. 
The second is as an academic who's made a career out of unsettling, comfortable notions of identity, comfortable notions of justice, and a kind of convenient idea that the law stands as an alternative to violence. Lastly, I come to you as a scholar of Palestine and of Israel. So in my first capacity as law professor and as lawyer, I want to say a few things about the law. Law school is now in session <laughs> for a short time. I want, to say, I want to talk to you about the law of free speech and of academic freedom and of the constitutional right of a professor to speak his or her mind both inside and outside of the classroom. So let me start with a conclusion. A, cl a conclusion about the strength of Professor Salida's case, legal case, against the university for the actions that they took last week. In my view, as a professor of law, and as a civil rights lawyer for over 30 years, he will win if and when he files a lawsuit challenging this university's actions. He will. In this view, this is not just my view, in this view I've been joined by scores of constitutional law professors. We wrote a letter to the university explaining why this was an easy case. Many of them disagree vehemently with the content of Professor Salida's scholarly work and his tweets, but they all were in unanimous agreement that he cannot be punished or retaliated against. Um, on the basis of those tweets as a core principle of free, um, fr uh, free speech and academic freedom. So <clears throat> most of you are not lawyers, so allow me to give you a little summary of why I think this is an easy case. First, as a simple matter of employment law, Illinois law is quite clear that he has a claim for a breach of an employment contract. Now I won't ask you to endure a real law school-like lecture on the fine points of promissory estoppel or detrimental reliance. It's, you know, after seven, you'd be asleep so fast, you, you wouldn't even know it. So you're just going to have to take my word on it that this is a strong claim. But the constitutional questions, of course, are more pressing, more complex, and quite frankly, much more interesting. So the First Amendment's free speech clause was designed to prevent precisely what happened here. A state entity, in this case, the trustees of a public university, cannot refuse to hire and cannot fire an employee on account of the content of his speech on a matter of public concern, period. End of argument. They may disagree with his viewpoint. They may even find his viewpoint troubling or offensive. But if he's otherwise qualified for that appointment, which we know he is and was, after being vetted by your faculty and your provost, the university's board of trustees may not refuse um, to hire him on the basis of his speech, period. This is a textbook violation of the First Amendment's free speech clause. To be honest, this case wouldn't even work well as a law school final exam question. <laughs> because the right answer is so obvious. <laughs> And I'm always looking for new things to use as exam questions. This one won't work, thankfully. So the Supreme Court has found in case after case that the right to free speech secured by the First Amendment has particularly important purchase in the academic context. In fact, many, many of the Supreme Court's landmark free speech cases have involved threats to the speech rights of educators. In few other pre precincts of society are First Amendment values more important um, and more dearly held than they are in the academy. So my first slide, Carol Merrill. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you a little bit of law and so that you can stay with me. I've got it on a, on a couple of PowerPoints here. So the Supreme Court noted in a very important academic free speech case, and this is Justice Brennan. Um, how, do you guys you want to listen or do you want to move? OK. <laughs> Our nation is deeply committed to safeguarding academic freedom, which is of transcendent value to all of us and most, not merely to the teachers concerned. That freedom is therefore a special concern of the First Amendment, which does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy 
over the classroom. Such a fundamentally important idea. So the claims raised by Professor Salida in a truncated 140 character fashion in his tweets and in a rigorous, careful, and academic way in his scholarship engage one of the most vexing human rights issues of the day, certainly one being debated across the globe in courtrooms, in various divisions of the United Nations, in legislatures and parliaments, in the media, and of course in our classrooms and on our campuses. If we can't deliberate about these issues critically in an academic setting, where can we? American universities have been the home to vigorous political and philosophical debate and disagreement on issues such as racial justice, the Vietnam War, pornography, nuclear weapons, South African apartheid, US foreign policy in Central America, Iraq and Afghanistan, the, the rights of religious minorities, the rights of lesbians and gay men to serve openly in the US military, and today, the relations between Israel and Palestine. This issue comes to our campuses um, after, as part of a long line of difficult, contested questions we've debated on our campuses. So now, the objection has been made, even by the members of the Board of Trustees, that the commitment that we see in this case, and in this language from the Supreme Court, to robust debate in the academic setting ends where the speech on one side becomes discriminatory, hateful, or hostile in such a way that it interferes with the learning environment for some students. The argument goes that the First Amendment right to free speech has a limit, and it reaches that limit when the speech in question is biased or bigoted in nature. This argument is just plain wrong, and it's wrong for two reasons. First, it's wrong as a matter of law. The Constitution's protection of speech rights protects all speech, even speech we might find odious or offensive. But more importantly, and this is so much at stake in this case, more in part importantly, this argument rests on an erroneous premise that any criticism of Israel is necessarily anti-Semitic in nature. This faulty premise voiced over and over explicitly by members of your board of trustees last Thursday confuses criticism of the actions of a state, in this case Israel, with hatred or bias toward the people who make up the majority in that state. That is the kind of facile and reductive argument that would never survive even the most cursory of examinations in an academic context. It is a lazy, polemical argument. <laughs> For the chancellor and the members of the board of trustees to countenance such an argument when making one of the most important decisions within their mandate constituting an academic faculty is, to be quite honest, shocking. Shocking. So let me give you another example that might further illuminate the ideological agenda that underwrites the reduction of criticism of Israel to always being anti-Semitic. One of my central academic projects over the last countless years, more than I'd like to count, has been a critical examination of the strategies of the same-sex marriage movement and lawyers. I've argued largely against the grain of most opinion in the gay community that prioritizing marriage equality is a terrible mistake. That's, a that's the lecture I was gonna give <laughs> on campus, right? That it has transformed a radical sexual rights movement into an assimilationist, conservative, and sexist movement. So I've made this argument in a nuanced way on the pages of the nation's best law reviews and in a forthcoming book called Wedlocked. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> and I've made the argument in very colorful, queer, and colloquial ways in speaking engagements and in my blog. It would be ludicrous 
to describe my criticism of the marriage equality campaign as homophobic in nature. I just have a very strong disagreement with the arguments that those advocates make, the power they wield, and the significance of the violence they cause to individuals and families whose lives don't line up um, easily and nicely in the marital form. My criticisms of marriage equality, well known on my campus and it seems shared here with many of you, do not create a hostile learning environment for gay and lesbian students. They know I have a controversial voice on this issue. Some of them love it. Some of them think I'm nuts. Some of them tolerate me and a substantial group want to know more. But all recognize that my position on this issue does not pollute my campus or the campuses where I speak with something we might recognize as homophobia. Criticism of the ideas and formations of power do not reduce always already to forms of bigotry and bias. <clears throat> Similarly divisive issues permeate our campuses all the time, both inside and outside the classroom, from the question of abortion rights to gun control to immigration to the assertion of religion as a justification for an exemption from the Affordable Care Act's mandate um, to provide contraception to all employees. We don't run from discussion of these hotly contested issues. We engage them head on. That's what we do as academics. This deeply treasured value was put well by Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis in 1927 <laughs> when he observed <laughs> that the best remedy to apply to speech we abhor is more speech, not enforced silence. <laughs> Go Justice Brandeis. This principle is no more work, more, nowhere more compelling than here in an academic context. So now, the University of Illinois, and I, just stop me by waving or snapping or something if I'm telling you things you already know and I'm boring you with it, but it's had other low moments. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to threats to academic freedom, particularly when discussing controversial issues of the day. Fortunately for me, you have fantastic archivists and librarians here. <laughs> And you got a, you've got a website that documents the history of threats to academic freedom on this campus. So you did my research for me. So I have two examples. I'm going to skip over the first one um, that has to do with um, anti-communist activities in the 40s. But the second um, is just much more fun. And this is about Professor Leo Koch, who was here in the 60s. He was a professor in your biology department, and he um, entered into a spirited, shall we say, debate in the uh, Daily Illini um, after the paper had published an article that criticized heavy petting parties, <laughs> a genre of party with which I was not previously familiar, <laughs> but which truly intrigues me. <laughs> so he responded to this article condemning heavy petting parties by writing a letter to the Daily Illini. He wrote, a mutually satisfactory sexual experience would eliminate the need for many hours of frustrating petting. <laughs> Who doesn't share that concern? And would lead to happier and longer lasting marriages among our younger men and women. As a result, he defended the idea of sort of trial and error, premarital sex, and, marriages, uh, and trial marriages among mature adults. A storm erupted on campus as a result of his letter. He was suspended and fired by the university, and the president of the university called him offensive, or his letter offensive and repugnant. You didn't know about this. That's great. So despite protests that framed his termination as a violation of principles of academic freedom, the board of trustees, yes, upheld his termination. The university was then censured by the American Association of University Professors. Sound familiar? <laughs> Rightly so. So just as Professor Koch was regarded as a sex radical, if not a pervert, because the other things he did when he left the university are less, um, more complicated, shall we say. 
but he was, he was regarded as a radical and a pervert who was out of step with a particular view of sexual decorum held by university um, uh, uh, leaders in the early 60s. And so too, those who refused to sign loyalty oaths repudiating communism were seen as dangerous radicals who threatened the hearts and minds of young Illinois students in the 1940s. Today, we face a similar controversy surrounding the positions taken by academics whose criticism of the politics of the state of Israel are out of step with the opinions of this university's leadership, some of its largest donors, and a powerful lobby that seeks to censure speech critical of Israel on college campuses. Back to the Supreme Court, they could not be clearer in condemning this kind of affront to academic freedom. So one last quote from Justice Brennan, it's a long one. Um, in a case successfully challenging a similar statute uh, to the one you had in Illinois, but ours was in New York, that prohibited subversives from employment as teachers in public schools. So Justice Brennan, um, one of our um, stars of, uh, on the Supreme Court defending the First Amendment, wrote that to impose any straitjacket upon the intellectual leaders in our colleges and universities would imperil the future of our nation. No field of education is so thoroughly comprehended by man that new discoveries cannot yet be made. Particularly is that true in the social sciences, where few, if any, principles are accepted as absolutes. <laughs> what about the humanities? <laughs> anyway, maybe I hadn't heard of them, I don't know. Scholarship cannot flourish in an atmosphere of suspicion and distrust. Teachers and students must always remain free to inquire, to study, and to evaluate to gain new maturity and understanding. Otherwise, our civilization will stagnate and die. This is the reasoning why this, uh, Professor Salaita's case is an, easy, is an easy case. So I project these quotes from the Supreme Court's free speech cases to suggest a poster campaign on this campus plastering the walls with the words from the Supreme Court. They speak truth to power. But more than that, they speak power to power. So take these slides, put them on fun sort of old timey posters and put them all over this campus. We will put them up on mine too. So what's taken place on this campus since early August when Chancellor Wise first informed Professor Salida that the finalization of his appointment was in jeopardy is not an isolated incident. It's part of a concerted, well-coordinated political strategy by certain defenders of Israel in general and um, of a particular form of political Zionism, uh, particularly, that seek to purge, as I said before, the Academy of Scholars, Research, and Speech that defends the human rights and sovereignty of Palestinians. We've watched, I myself, very closely, similar witch hunts at Columbia, at Northeastern, at several campuses in the University of California system, and at a number of other schools where students have been punished and student organizations have been decertified on account of their speech that was critical of Israel or expressed some sympathy for the sovereignty interests of Palestinians. We've witnessed our provost being blanketed, blanketed with pressure from outside actors to deny tenure to faculty up for promotion whose scholarship challenges a Zionist justification of the dispossession of Palestinians. And complaints have been filed with the Federal Department of Education by the Zionist Organization of America alleging that some universities tolerate a hostile climate for Jewish students because the university did not censure student speech in favor of Palestinian rights. So not only does criticism of the state of Israel amount to anti-Semitism in this, this set of arguments, but sympathy for the plight of Palestinians so too is anti-Semitic in nature at its core. Just this week, in fact, the Department of Education dismissed such a complaint filed against um, Rutgers University, finding that exposure to such robust and discordant expressions, even when personally offensive and possibly hurtful, is a circumstance that a reasonable student in higher education may experience and should be, or could be exposed to. Last year, the Department of Ed also dismissed the suits against uh, similar complaints against, um, uh, of discrimination against the UC Berkeley, Santa Cruz, and Irvine. Uh, part of the problem with these attempts to censure the students, the universities, and our scholarship, I think, is that it doesn't give our students enough credit. 
they can take it. They need to develop the critical skills to engage arguments they disagree with or find offensive. That's what we do as educators, is help arm them with those arguments. So the Salida case, um, uh, lastly, raises two more issues that I'd like to briefly address before hearing from this amazing panel um, uh, of, of local talent um, who know so much more about these issues than I. So apart from the threat to the well-established bedrock principles of free speech, the refusal to finalize Professor Salida's appointment raises a question of the relevance of faculty members' extracurricular speech. Speech on Twitter, speech on Facebook, perhaps speech here, um, particularly speech on matters of public concern, and the relevance of that speech to their suitability as a university instructor. instructor. In other words, what is the relevance, um, if any, um, of that faculty member's out of the classroom speech to their fitness to perform in the classroom and to run a fair and rigorous classroom. More than that, does the revelation of a, a professor's political views outside the classroom have the potential to poison um, his or her reputation in a curricular context? So much so that some students would feel unwelcome in that class or in their classes. This is, in a way, what the indictment was of Professor Salida. So I take this bill of particulars seriously. So over the last few days, I've perused the website of the Federal Elections Commission and other sites that publicly disclose contributions that individuals have made to um, PACs and other nonprofits to understand what sort of donations members of your faculty and board of trustees have made to political campaigns and causes that they support. Because as we know from Citizens United, financial contributions to political campaigns is a form of free speech of the highest order that deserves the most robust protection under the First Amendment. <laughs> you didn't expect me to cite Citizens United favorably. <laughs> But let's put it to work. So here's what I found. Many of your faculty have made donations, lots of dollars, thousands of dollars to Barack Obama's presidential campaign and to the Democratic National Committee. So too, many, not as many, but many of your faculty have contributed to Republican political candidates. John McCain, George W. Bush, Rich, Rick Santorum, Mitt Romney. Remember those guys? <laughs> One faculty member in the medical school gave tens of thousands of dollars to Lyndon LaRouche's presidential campaigns and PACs. You can look it up. I'm not going to name names. You probably know who these people are. <laughs> Some of these candidates that faculty have strongly supported through the exercise of their First Amendment right to give money hold views that have been portrayed that I think actually are openly homophobic openly racist, openly anti-Semitic, and AIDS phobic, Lyndon LaRouche in particular. Other candidates for whom faculty have expressed strong support hold views that are hostile to the First Amendment, to the sanctity of human life, and to marriage as a sacred bond between a man and a woman, or one man and one woman. I've also traced the contributions that your faculty have made to political causes, such as pro-marriage equality, and anti-marriage equality, pro-choice and anti-choice, in favor of stand your ground laws and against stand your ground laws. So just so you know, Chris Kennedy's FEC filings <laughs> show that he's made substantial contributions to the campaigns of Evan Bayh, Mark Warner, uh, Dick Durbin, Sheldon Whitehouse, J uh, John Kerry, Jesse Jackson Jr., Barack Obama, and Claire McCaskill among other politicians in the region and nationally, as well as to a kind of ad hoc democratic organization in his community on the North Shore of Chicago. He's also given very generously to a PAC that represents real estate interests, the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, Inc. So what should we make of this kind of extracurricular speech by faculty and top administrators? Speech that could, be conceivably, that could conceivably create a hostile environment for gay students, female students, Christian, Muslim, Jewish students, or students of color on your campus. 
Or in the case of Kennedy's contributions, do they send a message that the University of Illinois is not a welcome place for conservative or Republican students? I don't hear a clamor that this kind of political speech threatens the suitability of these professors to teach in a fair, balanced, and rigorous way, or that Kennedy is capable of governing, or incapable, that is, of governing in a diverse university system, such as the University of Illinois, nor do I hear that these strong views expressed by the faculty and leadership of the university through their giving indicate, as, Professor, or excuse me, as President Easter said in his remarks at the Board of Trustees meeting the other day, um, indicate that they would be capable of fostering, incapable of fostering a classroom environment where conflicting opinions would be given equal consideration regardless of the issue being discussed. This strikes me as a moment where what's good for the goose, in this case Professor Salida, may be equally good for the gander, such as the other members of the University of, uh, of Illinois faculty and it's more particularly its administrative leadership. Chancellor Wise, by the way, does not give money away. Um, that is at least registered by the Federal Election Commission. Do with that, do with that what you want. If anything is a bedrock of con a con a principle of the Constitution, it's that the First Amendment protects speech in the form of financial contributions to the political campaigns and causes of your choosing. It also protects your participation in debate on matters of public concern, whether in highbrow venues such as scholarly journals and books, or lowbrow venues such as um, uh, Facebook or Twitter. By and large, the university has sought to parry the serious constitutional objections to their handling of the Salida appointment by taking the position that it did not refuse to hire him on account of his views on Israel, but on account of his tone. Right, you know this. Chancellor Wise declared essentially a new civility norm on campus and said that she will not tolerate pers uh, comments that are um, disrespectful or actions that demean or abuse um, either viewpoints themselves or those who express them. She needs some help from the English department <laughs> in, in some of the construction of these new norms so you know how to comply with them. Civility, it turns out, should be the governing norm here um, and unfortunately uh, on a number of other campuses um, across the country. So let me say one thing emphatically. Whatever else civility may be, it is not an academic norm. Rigor is an academic norm. Making arguments backed by evidence is an academic norm. A willingness to re-examine our settled premises in the service of understanding a problem more fully and more carefully is an academic norm. Civility is not an academic norm. Quite the opposite. Civility undermines the very values we hold dear in the academy. Civility has the air of something that is taught in finishing schools. <laughs> or to women to be more ladylike. My mother sent me to dancing school when I was 10 to learn the foxtrot and the waltz so that I would be more ladylike and more civil. That strikes me as the appropriate place for civility to be invoked. I hated it. So from an early age, George Washington advanced a gentlemanly sense of civility. He's well known 110 rules of civility and decent behavior, hold on one sec, um, in company and conversation included the following precepts on civility. Strive not with your superiors in argument, but always submit your judgment to others with modesty. If two contend together, not the part of either unconstrained Wait, if two contend together, take not the part of either unconstrained and be not obstinate in your own opinion. In things indifferent, be of the major side. So what does this mean? If two people disagree, do not take one side or the other. Be flexible in your own opinions. And when you don't care, take the majority opinion. <laughs> That's a civility norm. Next, in company of these of higher quality than yourself, speak not till you are asked a question then stand upright, put of your hat, I think that means remove, and answer in a few words. 
that is a civility norm. And then my favorite, shift not yourself in the sight of others, <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> I think that's what that means. <laughs> nor gnaw your nails. <laughs> I mean, if there's anything that we do in an academic context, it's gnaw, gnaw our nails. I'm not gonna weigh in on the shifting of yourselves. <laughs> particularly in the sight of others. <laughs> so so the, the, the invocation of civility as a regulatory norm in the academic context is best understood as a form of what we call in law prior restraint. Restraint of unconventional ideas, restraint of impassioned argument, and restraint designed to trump down student and faculty activism on the pressing political matters of the day. The uncivil university is something to applaud, not condemn. You can applaud there. These new civility norms that are popping up, like Topsy, or is that what it, that, that vine is that's in the south? Kudzu. Kudzu, yes, that vine, like Kudzu, um, from university to uni university, ignore the power of ideas, their inherent unruliness, and the capacity, indeed obligation, of students and faculty to engage ideas that upend settled notions of the right and the good. Even worse, the timing of the uptick in civility rhetoric by university leadership across the country is no accident. To those of us who've defended academic freedom on this issue in recent years, on the issue of Israel-Palestine, um, these new civility codes echo in profoundly disappointing ways um, the framing that's been advanced by political operatives who seek to capture the parameters of discussion of Israel and of Palestine in an academic context. This is their new strategy advanced in a well-organized public relations campaign aimed at university executives, portray criticisms of Israel as uncivil and purge Israel's critics from our universities on the ground that their ideas are out of place, misplaced, have no place in a context governed by an incivility norm. Last slide. As Oliver Wendell Holmes reminded us during the anti-communist purges in the 1920s and the 1950s, every idea is an incitement. Just love that. Every idea is an incitement. The only difference between the expression of an opinion and the, an excitement in the narrower sense is the speaker's enthusiasm for the result. Eloquence may set fire to reason. The Supreme Court does not write like that anymore. I join you, I join Professor Salida, and I join scholars in all of our universities in a solemn pledge to continue inciting a new generation of students with ideas that refuse an obedience to orthodoxy and that threaten to disorder, disorder, settled notions of belonging, dispossession, and identity on this campus and in Palestine, Israel. In other words, I recommit tonight to the value of an uncivil university. Thank you. been a week of rather uh, depressing days and you know you brought some really important energy to our campus. So today uh, as Catherine did say we have local luminaries. Local not in the you know parochial sense. <laughs> um, and they will speak from what I understand is five minutes but you know we have to be a, a, not civil but I'll be I won't be stamping your opportunities to speak. 
So uh, they will speak for about five minutes and then we will have um, a Q&A session. And uh, just for the speakers, thank you actually means shut up. <laughs> um, so let me introduce all, all of the panelists in the order they will speak. And uh, the first uh, speaker is Michael Rothberg, professor and head of the Department of English here at the U of I where he's also director of the Initiative on Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies. He's the author and co-editor of several books, including Multidirectional Memory, Remembering the Holocaust in the Age of Decolonization. Our second speaker is Iman Ghanayem, is a, who is a doctoral student in the Department of English and American Indian Studies here at the UI. And she has been a central voice in student activism in the wake of the, uh, the firing of Stephen Salida. Our third speaker is Chantal Nadeau, who's professor of gender and women's studies, and uh, where she also coordinates the Intersect Project on the cultures of law in global contexts. She has published widely on questions of rights, sexuality, and nationalist rhetoric on, uh, in transnational contexts. Our fourth speaker is Brenda Sanya, who's a doctoral student in the Department of Educational, uh, Education Policy, Organization, and Leadership with a specialization in global studies in education and a GWS minor in queer studies. She has published research on electronic media in rural Kenya and transnational feminist discourse. Lastly, definitely not the least, Robert Warrior, Director of American Indian Studies where he is also professor of or he is also professor of English and history here at our university. He's an enrolled member of the Osage Nation, and he's a, an author of several books on American Indian literature, politics, and intellectual history. So let's welcome. That's a hard act to follow. Um, I want to thank the organizers and the hosts. Um, so many smart and powerful things have already been said about our topic, not least by Catherine Frankie and also by other people on the panel with me, and I'm honored to share, the, share it with them. I decided to step back and try to theorize the nature of the event that we are living through and the political response to it. My questions are, what has made this case so powerful for so many people and what are the implications of that fact for political mobilization? My first hypothesis is that the Stephen Saleda case has become a national and even international affair because of the way it condenses multiple ongoing crises. Other cases share many features with this one, but the Salida affair has hit a particular nerve and may well be remembered as a landmark case by virtue of the extraordinary number of very current flashpoints it brings together. To enumerate what is a long but no doubt incomplete list, I have in mind the following critical features. The type of job Salaita was offered in comparative indigenous studies, the particular political conjuncture in which that job was offered, the Israel-Palestine issue in its local and global manifestations, the kind of intellectual work Salida does, bringing together indigenous and Palestinian issues, the administrative logics that attend his hiring and firing, especially the erosion of faculty autonomy and meaningful shared governess in the face of corporatization, long-term trends, call them neoliberal, in the, in the economics of public higher education, including questions of funding and defunding, and struggles over labor conditions for tenure track and non-tenure track employees. The organization and prestige of academic disciplines, including splits between the humanities and social sciences on the one hand and STEM fields on the other. The politics of race and culture on campus, including discourses and practices of diversity. Developments in technology and media and tensions around their relation to education and scholarship and the changing parameters of free speech, including the monitoring of political speech and the turn towards civility on campus that we just heard about. In enumerating this incomplete list of contexts and crises that create the salience of the Salida case, 
I want to make a second relatively simple point, one that I think has significant consequences for political mobilization in the wake of Salida's firing. The Salida case is overdetermined. Overdetermination, you weren't expecting this, was a concept coined by Freud in the interpretation of dreams to explain how various elements of our dreams possess multiple meanings and cannot be reduced to unitary symbols, like the infamous and completely unFreudian claim, Freudian claim, for instance, that a cigar represents a phallic symbol. For Freud, meaning emerges instead from networks of association that assure that any given element in a dream has more than one signification. Several decades later, the Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser borrowed Freud's term to describe the complex causes of social phenomena. Like dreams, society is composed of multiple interlocking systems that ensure that politics plays out on a field where singular, clear-cut meanings are unlikely to be found. Althusser draws our attention instead to the layered and sometimes incompatible contradictions that characterize any social formation. As Althusser notes, the multiplication of overdetermined contradictions can lead in either of two directions, to revolutionary rupture or to the blockage of social change. This may sound a bit grandiose, but I think his insight speaks to our situation. First, the concept of overdetermination helps explain why the Salida case has been so mobilizing for so many people. The coalitions of faculty and students that have been involved include many people I've never seen politically active or so deeply upset by campus politics before. I think we have to imagine that people have come to this cause for many different, perhaps contradictory reasons. Some that might have to do with the politics of Israel-Palestine, some that have to do with the governance of universities, some with the politics of free speech, and of course some uh, for, for several of the above. Such multiplicity has been a positive factor in mobilization, but the fact of overdetermination in politics means, second, that we also have to think seriously about the limits of coalition building and about the problem of how to hold together different interests and, and expand our base. We don't need to convince everyone, and there always has to be an oppositional, antagonistic moment in mobilization in order to create solidarity within a coalition. But we do need, for instance, to cross the divide between the two cultures of the university and to reach the STEM fields if we want to exert real power on our campus. And I think we also need to reach more people who are genuinely concerned about the content and mode of expression of some of Stephen Salaita's tweets and who might have less radical positions on the Israel-Palestine question than many of us do. Some of these people are already with us. See the boycott statements of Jonathan Judakin and David Blacker, for instance. But we could reach even more if we address people's concerns about anti-Semitism head on. Reflecting back on the long list of crises and context I mentioned at the beginning of my short remarks, the ultimate point I want to leave you with is this. At stake here is, first of all, the question of justice for Stephen Salida and for the American Indian Studies program that selected him in their search. But the overdetermined contradictions that this case illuminates indicate to me that we are also close to the core of crucial insights about today's political reality. The political reality of higher education, to be sure, but something much bigger than that as well. Thanks. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I just want to add to, the, uh, to what was said about me that I'm a student from Palestine and uh, I write about Palestine. So this is the lens through which I'm speaking um, today. And um, uh, when I was um, generously invited to speak here today, uh, this is what my frustration produced. So I hope it doesn't sound too, too angry or maybe it should. So here it goes. Um, I would like to start my commentary by pointing out to that aspect of Stephen Salaita's scholarship and the one I'm working on developing, which aims at comparing American Indian narratives to Palestinian ones. It is noteworthy that both Stephen Salaita and I agree, as well as the AAS faculty I've been working under and whose insight has been the most useful, if not life-shifting, 
that these comparisons are not made for the purpose of conflating the two or creating good-looking parallelisms, but rather connecting them for the main purpose of finding ways to counter the colonial violence and policing these communities have been forced into. One similarity that sounds out in the Stephen Salaita affair that not only connects him to the American Indian, but also to other minorities that have been striving for their liberation is how these minorities have been loosely accused by the power that polices their bodies and minds of being complicit or responsible in their own tragic living, deeming their actions of resistance as criminal and deserving of contempt and punishment. The discourse that has been employed against Stephen Salata is nothing short of atrocious and disgusting and has criminalized him in ways that need serious attention and repair. Looking back into statements written criticizing Stephen Salaita, sadly sometimes those written in support of him, and the language used throughout the BOT meeting, a few examples stand out. One, in one of the statements criticizing Stephen Salaita and describing him as dangerous to the U of I community, his words were called vulgar, vulgar being akin to other words that have been in use against Palestinians like savage, barbaric, and animal, non-human as well is a word that was used by the author very spontaneously or maybe well intended in complete disregard to how words such as vulgar have been used to justify and further the occupation of Palestinians. In one of his speeches, Netanyahu called Israel the only civilization in the middle of the jungle. He also repeatedly referred to Arabs as barbarians. We go back to how these words have been used against certain communities in the US. And though people, academics at least, now know better than describe an American Indian scholar or otherwise a savage or barbarian. In the, neoliberal, in, the, in the neoliberal world, the US has created the image of the Palestinian remains easily accessible for a character assassination of the sort without the slightest shame or even the slightest self-consciousness. Two, most statesmen still dissociate Stephen Salaita from the context he speaks from. He's a Palestinian living in diaspora, still has relatives who are subjected to persecution in Palestine, and whose tweets comment on one of the most atrocious crimes of 2014, if not of the 21st century, that resulted in the killing of almost 2,900 people. As we speak, Gazan patients in hospitals are losing fights against their wounds. People are taken into jail for protesting injustices. Just today, they took 10, 10 Palestinians in Jerusalem who were um, protesting and trying to rebuild their, they're trying, um, and many are trying to cope with mental and physical disabilities and trying to rebuild their homes and provide good living for their families. Yet in the weird mess this has created, Stephen Salaita commentating on crimes becomes the criminal. Whereas people who killed those 2,900 people, killed what amounts to a quarter of a million and displaced almost eight million people are not criminal. Those sending aid are not criminals. Those whose tax money pay for Israel weaponry are not complicit. Three, even some of the discourse that has acknowledged the victimhood of Stephen Salaita lacks enough or any engagement with who he is, the nation he belongs to, and their project of decolonization that has been ongoing for almost 80 years now, since the time of the British mandate in the region. Some of his supporters have defended his tweets by calling them emotional, employing the logic of, he's writing these tweets, by, um, he's writing these things because of how the conflict personally affects him and his emotions, and thus he has the right to be angry and use any language that comes out in the spirit of the moment. The use of such discourse also goes in line with what has been used against Palestinians throughout history. They're not intellectual beings in control of their words and actions, but they're feeling led, sentimental, and in some cases, stupid. The suicide bomber is not an intellectual being, the protester is not an intellectual being. The politician is not an intellectual being. The person whose house just got bombed is not an intellectual being. They need to be disciplined, in some cases, civilized. Israel did to the Middle East what no Arab has done, bring a civilization to the jungle. I go back to that statement because it's important to see what one should and should not say when talking about Palestinians and their culture that has always been creative, literary, and diverse until it was usurped, deformed, and in some cases appropriated for the foundation of a new illegal state. Palestine is more than Edward Said. It's Ibrahim Tuqan, Mahmoud Darwish, Fadwa Tuqan, Samih Al Qasim, Suhair Hamad, Rashid Khalidi, Rabab Abdul Hadi, Hatim Bazian, Tamim Al Barghouti, Rasmi Aude, Ghassan Kanafani, Najil Ali, and Stephen Salat, amongst others. And these are names of people who have been persecuted, persecuted for their scholarship, for their literature. Some were assassinated while crossing the streets of Beirut and London in the last century. Four, 
In the BOT meeting, one of those, requested pub one of those who requested public comment was an ex-trustee who said, without self-restraint, without shame, without raising eyebrows and causing a fuss, that he does not want, and I'm quoting him here, Stephen Salato to be the face of this fine institution. Nobody, sto nobody stood up and said, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with Stephen Salato's face? Why can't this, institu can this institution has as one of its faces a brown Palestinian face? They did not. They did not call it racism or bias. They did not call it uncivil or malice. Instead, they applauded him. Chairman Kennedy screamed a thank you that he did not use with any of the other speakers. His statement was celebrated. Nobody wants the face of a criminal to be the face of the academy after all. That's how the logic goes. In my conclusion, I'm saying I'm sharing these little nuances to show, to show their great damage. I think it's about time that the academy, or generally speaking, it's about time that we start questioning the, how small words like these can create a big damage. I'm here to comment on academic freedom by saying that the reason why those in support of Chancellor Wise's decision also employed a discourse of academic freedom is because it has always been the case that some people are excluded from that freedom anyways. Stephen Salata as a Palestinian is physically not free. He remains policed like me and everyone else who dares to criticize Israel or criticize power, generally speaking. The fact that he's not academically free should not come as a shock to us and should, should not only tie to his ethnicity, but also tie to how the academy functions at times like a state that permits, prohibits, and, punishment, and punishes without accountability and as I said before, without shame, and in some cases, the least bit of self-awareness. Thank you. Fia Martins uh, will step in. Um, I, I, first, I want to thank the Illinois Faculty for Ac Academic Freedom and Justice Group. Um, and for those of you who wonder who we are, I just want to offer my um, little bit by saying that we're um, a spontaneous but very resilient co coalition of very mad faculty who care. <laughs> so here we know, you know who we are. Um, so I know so ma many of you are in the audience tonight, so I want to thank you for coming. Um, so on September 11, 2014, the Board of Trustees rubber stamped Chancellor Wise's recommendation to not hire Stephen Salaya. In an upsetting majority vote of eight to one, Trustee James Montgomery casting the only no, the trustees decided with the Chancellor in her assessments that Salaya's presence on this campus or his face was not welcome. In the days and even minutes before the votes, many saluted the Chancellor's position as one guided by courage. I want to take a few minutes tonight to reflect on the ways the rhetoric of courage has been articulated in the Salatas case. Far from making Salatas firing a state of exception, I use this case as an illustration of what's cooking right now in the academe for scholars whose intellectual and teaching missions is to provide critical tools to understand how discrimination, social injustice, and inequalities shape both the social and academic economy. I, su I suggest that the language of courage has become a means by which the privileged few appropriate a position to step up, to speak up, and to speak at the expense of those who have been historically injured. Courage, how, no how noble it sounds. As a queer theorist, I have been interested in the ways that the rhetoric of courage has been used in a, in a series of LGBT civil rights battles over the past few years. Courage has emerged as a mode of public address in battle over same-sex marriage and the repel of don't ask, don't tell, for, insta for instance. Queers and non-queers are asked to show courage and demonstrate their civic engagement and duty by supporting demands for equality. Courage is asserted as a virtue, a mark of self-abnegation, of self-sacrifice for the good of all and for the nation. The language of courage promotes a patriotic ideal of the community, a community in which dissent 
is ushed in order to leave room for the real American cultural values of military service, family, liberal economy, and tolerance as a whole. It is no coincidence that most of the legal battles for LGBT rights for the past years have been for rights that fall under good civility and service provisions. The rhetoric of courage is evoked to produce and maintain a particular vision of the political order and not to provide new models of citizenship. Ultimately, to be courageous is to be civil in the current context. So over the past few weeks, many of my colleagues have articulated beautifully how the Salete case is deeply entrenched in broader concerns about shared governance, academic freedom, and also the perpetuation of structural racism, homophobia, and sexism on this campus. So to claim that wise decision and action is a matter of courage, as we have heard quite extensively, is to consolidate a top-down model of governance and a culture of, of sameness in which the people of courage are actually the people who have incommensurable discretionary power. In this case, the president of the University of Illinois, the chancellors of the Urbana campus, and the chair of the board of trustees. I don't want to name them. When Chancellor Wise and her supporters use the language of courage to manufacture a discourse of civility, they legitimize racist interpretation of academic work and consolidate a campus climate in which free speech and political protest can be portrayed as bullying. But we all know that bullying is the, the privilege of the big and the strong and not of the weak and the oppressed. So the language of courage redirects our sense of who is under threat. In using the rhetoric of courage to describe chancellors wise, commentators discredit the scholars, students, and academic units who have worked for years in a climate of physical and institutional violence, often under precarious conditions, negotiating threats, and at the expense of their own intellectual and personal safety. In using the rhetoric of courage to describe Chancellor Wise, commentators portray courage as an aristocratic virtue rather than a value that conveys a fierce desire to bring academic work to bear on questions of social justice. The so-called courage displayed by and attributed by, to the Chancellor is in fact a breach of institutional procedures of due process by someone whose position of power insulates her from the protest of those who support academic freedom without qualification. So I don't have necessarily like a, a sort of like solution or like, you know, um, little bits for you to go home. Thank you. But uh, what I wanted to say is like, I think we need to pay attention to the, the way that language has been used on this campaign, on, in this case, and we need to sort of like work from that language as well. Thank you. taller than everyone. Um, thank you, Professor Frankie, for coming and joining us. Um, and I, I think one of your talks, you talked about how after the boycott or after things go past the um, moment of um, acute intensity, there's a question of where to go from here. And so thank you for coming and joining us. Um, I'm grateful to be on this panel. Um, but before I go ahead, I'd like to thank the student organizers who have tirelessly reminded us that um, this case is um, entirely about Stephen Salider, but it is also about American Indian Studies, and it's also larger than Stephen Salider and American Indian Studies. So I'll just name them really quickly. Iman, Rico, Ahmed, Raquel, Christine, Stephanie, Matt, and then the numerous other invisible organizers. Thank you. And so um, I'm grateful to be in conversation with you all because in thinking about these um, precariousness of the work done by scholars who focus on the Middle East, I obviously think about two of my very dear friends, Meva de la Cruz and Saeed Atshan. And actually, Professor Frankie and I just found out that we both know Saeed because he um, led the LGBT delegation that she was on in 2012 to Palestine. Um, and in um, conversation with them over the past decade, they've spoken into my work and um, kind of given me some insights about citizenship and thinking about belonging and how bodies belong 
and a gap in which certain bodies are no longer valid in that conversation. And so in my conversations with Maver and Syed, a few persistent questions have emerged. What does it mean when hollow signifiers such as diversity become the hallmark of institutions, while at the same time, those institutions are obviously punishing certain individuals for their participation in the fullness of their ideals and not for their hollow signifiers? How do we understand or navigate around and through the gaps we see between regulatory discourses that are seemingly capacious, so here I'm thinking about laws, rules, and such categories, and the gap where certain scholars' work is located. Graduate students are obviously part of this conversation, and this case serves as, in many ways, a gag order on our politics and our projects and the kind of work that we do. It is a reminder that, of the ways in which we are vulnerable. Um, and even those of us who, you know, who have been actively involved in social media, we already knew that we were being Googled before we do anything, and we now know that in very explicit terms, that even if we're interviewing for a position with people who think that our work is cool or our politics are valuable, our work is seemingly inconsequential and that the value of our work is not as important as the social media presences we have. What does it mean then, and I mean this, I know that it changes how we teach and how we write and what will be in our dissertations and the kind of jobs that we get. So then how can we think about whether we want to implicate ourselves or how can we, for example, for me, I think, how can I unimplicate myself from my political presence online? Not that I'm trying to, but that's a question that I think we all have to contend with. Um, and I think what has been said um, covers the question of thinking about teaching and teaching to incite. And I think it's important um, for that to continue to happen, but there has to be a way that we navigate through our feelings of vulnerability and concern about this new climate. And that's not to say that we are naive. Um, the politics um, of what we think and what we say has always been risky business in academia, but especially now, um, I guess it's up, oh, especially now, we as graduate students, um, we should care more about this question of freedom of speech because it is something that we are implicated in and we have to be part of the conversation. And this goes beyond those of us who are working in Arab and Arab American studies. And granted that that field and being in that field is definitely risky business, there are other risks that also come people of color, women, queer people, people with disabilities, people who um, are religious in marginalized religions, um, people whose sexual and gender categories don't fit into boxes that we want them to fit. There's an extra layer that crystallizes what we already knew about the undesirability of certain bodies, um, as Iman said so eloquently. And this is crucial because our intellectual projects are deeply connected to who we are. So in the issue of civility, Civility becomes then a frightening thing, and even to some extent threatening. I don't know what my behavior will mean for the health of my work and the projects that I'm interested in. And so when will then, we can also always think about when will our projects become problematic. And so where do we go from here? And I think that's a question that I leave for all of us. Thank you. Good evening, and thanks everyone for, for coming out. It's, uh, it's great to see everybody tonight, and uh, I want to thank uh, Catherine um, for uh, bringing us all together uh, through, her, um, through her act of protest, uh, and uh, through her also through her act of um, compassion uh, for us here, and for her act of compassion towards Stephen. I also want to thank her for articulating so well her position towards uh, uh, the assimilative nature of the, uh, the, uh, her position on same-sex marriage. I've been trying to convince Chantal of that position for years now. <laughs> and uh, so finally, I think, <laughs> I think Chantal gets it. So um, that's really good. So thank you for that. Um, but uh, uh, it's, 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 it's really great to see everybody. And it's great to hear some scholarship. Uh, you know, it's really great to hear people speaking as scholars. Even though this is a public event where I don't feel like I'm uh, anything but associated and affiliated with the University of Illinois, uh, that I can speak freely uh, as, as just as a person and as a scholar who can be uh, proud of my scholarly accomplishments but somehow not burdened as somebody who has to say I'm uh, the director of this or a professor of that, that that's just an affiliation like it is when I sign something on the web. 
it's, it's nice to feel like a scholar uh, and, and not just somebody who's trying to cheerlead something or, or, or trying to introduce something at a press conference or speak to uh, a, a member of the press, although there are probably members of the press here. Uh, and uh, there's so many uh, incredibly important issues uh, that, that are in front of us. Uh, the one that Brenda just brought up that I think is so important does have to do with graduate students and graduate students really as leaders. And I remember when I was a graduate student realizing how important the role that we played as graduate students was in helping the professors who were in front of us understand what the new stakes were and what the stakes were going to be down the road. And that's not just, that's not a platitude. It really is something that's very true uh, for those of you who are now thinking, what are we going to do ahead? Part of what you're going to do ahead is, is get this work done while you're in the midst of the, this, this struggle that you put in front of yourself, those new issues. And, uh, and, and building that in, building in the formation of new knowledge in the midst of all of that, uh, and attaching yourself to ideas and theories and things that will make all of that meaningful is, is, is a big part of the challenge. But uh, I think that you've all gained so much in the process. So those of you who are undergraduates uh, as well, and thinking about what you want to do next, whether it's to become a, a civil rights lawyer like, uh, like my uh, person I want to be, my, um, my celebrity uh, court TV lawyer, Catherine Frankie, um, <laughs> or uh, whether you want to uh, do something uh, else, uh, I hope that you'll do it. Um, I, I wanted to just lay out just a little bit, going back to something that I see uh, as, I've been, as I've been teasing around in my, own, in my own mind about my own scholarly agenda coming out of this. I feel like I'm gonna be talking about this for a while. And it does go back to the goes, does go back to the tweets, and it does go back to the hard things that we have to to tease out. It's great to get this legal the, this legal framework in which to talk about the tweets, and I think that there's so much more about them. And as a scholar of of language and literature, but also as a scholar of American Indian studies and Indigenous studies, I do want to say thank you to everybody who, who who is remembering that this was an appointment that originated in our unit. You know, Vince Diaz said something the other day that I think was so important is that that maybe it wasn't a mistake that, that, that this appointment did in fact get targeted uh, uh, in a way that others wouldn't have in our unit because in fact people did see in, in the work that Stephen was doing a, a connection, a nexus that was being reached in our unit that was, that was really calling into question uh, what I would see coming out of uh, Aileen Morton Robinson's work. The real insecurity that comes with a certain kind of, uh, with a claim of sovereignty in the settler state that becomes very insecure once the indigenous, a certain kind of indigenous presence is felt and is, and is, uh, and challenges that, that form of sovereignty. And, and, and it's deeply felt, and, and she says that out of the Australian context through the Aboriginal context. Uh, and I think that, that we see that, we, we see that, that worldwide global uh, indigenous studies model uh, um, uh, being deployed where, where that kind of insecurity then is, is bringing itself uh, to bear in so many places. This is, a, this is a campus where, as I say it in my talk about the Edgar Heber Birds exhibit that was vandalized several years ago, where during the, during, while that exhibit was up and, and President Easter was our chancellor, uh, our interim chancellor, uh, he, he made the comment to a, to a national group of librarians that uh, one of the reasons why the University of Illinois had, had been so successful is because before the university there was nothing here, right? And so that, that same sense of terra nullius that, that pervades Australian discourse is in the mind of the president of our university, right? And, is in, in, and he apologized for that. We never made a big public, uh, big public stink about it. Maybe we should have, but it may not have had any traction at all at the time and would have just sounded like another complaint coming out of 1204 West Nevada Street. Um, but, but I think that there's something important about that, that sense of things. And I, that's why I thought it was really important in my comments to the Board of Trustees last week that I brought up the tweet. The reason I brought up the tweet about the, the, uh, the, the kidnapped uh, uh, teenagers, uh, some of whom were adults, by the way, um, at least one of whom was an adult, uh, that, that that I brought up the one, the, the gone missing tweet from June 19th of earlier this year was because I'd heard from a pretty authoritative source that that was the one that bothered the board the most. Um, and, uh, and I thought it was the one in my mind that needed to be interrogated from, a, from an indigenous studies perspective. You know, it was one the Chicago Tribune made the most of. Um, and when I first read it, I thought, yeah, you know, that is, boy, viscerally, that's one where you just kind of say, 
oh man, gone missing. Boy, Stephen says he wants that whole group of Israelis to go missing. And I thought, yeah, that's because there's a settlement on Palestinian land that, he, that he's talking about within that tweet. And how can that be the worst thing anybody ever said? Uh, and so then it's assumed on the other side, as you can even see in the comments in the Chronicle of Higher Ed today uh, in, in response to a piece that I wrote, where people still are making a really big deal about this tweet and saying, he said he wanted every Jew in that settlement to be killed by Hamas. I say, I really don't see that in that particular tweet. I can see that somebody could read that into it, but I don't see that when he says, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not as refined as everybody else, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it. And there we see the whole thing laid out, playing itself out right there before us, right? Where he says, I'm not refined, maybe as the rest of you. Maybe I'm not quite as civil as the rest of you, right? So I'm going to go ahead and say it. Why? Because look, this, I didn't say that this is at Professor Stephen Salida. This is at Steve Salida, doing this on Twitter, saying what I'm saying in whatever way I want to, because it's private, because I'm just going to say it, because it's on my mind. This is on June 19th. This is a weekend. This isn't after these three poor people were murdered. Uh, and left out in the desert, which is a tragedy, which is an awful thing. Other people were killed by the IDF searching for those boys, right? Palestinians were pe people were killed, were rounded up, were arrested in the midst of that, uh, what was called Operation Brothers Keepers. There's no way to go back in there and say there was anything good that came out of that. The Gaza ground war came out of that. The, the, the Gaza campaign came out of that. It was a terrible, awful thing. But there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's something about it where this particular tweet, I think, points us back to the settler, uh, to the, 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 the settler colony uh, that, that, those, that those settlements in Israel particularly occupy that land. I had a long time on my, on my Twitter feed, it's still there if you go back into it, you know, those maps of Israel that show the West Bank and Gaza and show over time what the settlements look like, what they looked like back in 1984 when I was driving through the West Bank, when I was a volunteer for the Israeli uh, Department of, of, uh, of Antiquities and Museums as an as a archaeology volunteer for two summers. And we'd say, yeah, these, are, these settlements are coming up. There's more and more of them. And here's, here's this one, here's that one. And people say, wow, this looks terrible. And then the next summer, there's more. And then over time, there's more and there's more and there's more. So it seemed like to me that this was the place where, where it was exactly at that, at, at that place where Stephen invokes this sense of, of the indigenous critical voice where there's a gap between the ability of people to understand and where he's not seeking to be understood really by an audience. And who he's even invoking in that audience, he's not speaking to a sleeper cell and in Virginia someplace that says, here's what I really want to say while nobody's looking. He says, all of you who are out there in my audience, which is you folks out there who are just people listening, who are going to hear this on Facebook, who follow me on Twitter, sometimes we get too refined about this, and I'm just going to say this. Now, I mean, there's more I could say about that. It's only five minutes. But I think that there's something there that goes back to this very deeply embedded sense of, of what that settlement as a settlement represents. And then if I were to say something like that, as I've said in various places, uh, stand up and say that as an Osage person in Missouri or in Oklahoma, if I were to say that as a Peoria person up here tonight, if I were Peoria or if I were Miamia, and were to stand up here and say, you know, there are times when I just say, I wish that the whole University of Illinois, the whole fucking University of Illinois would go missing. <laughs> Who would say it was that wrong? Right? Uh, maybe the Osages would like to go reclaim Columbia, Missouri, or one of those other towns, Joplin, Missouri, or someplace like that in the Ozarks. Maybe even Branson, I don't know. Anyway, uh, thanks so much to Catherine. It's been really inspiring. I want to say just one more thing, though, since this is a really public thing. It's not on campus. Uh, I was accused the other day in something that I read of being part of a hotbed of BDS in American Indian Studies. That's not really true, and it said that our campus is a hotbed of BDS. That's also not true. There's a very small number of people who have endorsed the U.S. campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Um, I'm saying this in a public space where I have my own politics on this. 
I endorsed the campaign back in January 2009. If anybody has uh, questions about the U.S. campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel, I'd be happy to answer your questions over a long cup of coffee. If you need me to buy you lunch, I'll do that as well. <laughs> if you have questions about it, I would love to talk to you about it. I'd love to see there be more people at the University of Illinois who sign on to, who sign on to that campaign and endorse it along with um, me and other people who are here. Thank you. Colleagues, and uh, we would like to open up the floor for questions for both Catherine and our luminaries. Um, so, uh, if you can stand up and um, just say, uh, go to the microphone, I guess. And if you are again uh, hesitant, uh, you can either slip me a paper or uh, ask someone to ask a question for you. So. I like to keep it tight, and so I'll jump right up. Um, on the, the last point about going missing, uh, the deaths, though known by the Israeli IDF before it was released public, didn't happen until June 30th. So his tweet was while they were still abductees. Right. And it is nominally the US policy that settlers be missing from occupied territories, though you wouldn't know it because uh, Obama pledged $70 billion the same day another 1,000 acre swap was, uh, um, whatever they call it, stolen, I'll call it, um, by the Israelis. But for Catherine Frankie, can you say a bit about the, um, the um, David project? Because I think they were, perhaps not. The David project? Dave, David. David. Oh, the David project. David project. They're based in, in uh, Boston, I guess, but they um, have a campus watch, sort of along the lines of Daniel Pipe's campus watch, and I think they were pretty fundamental in some of the agitation in a cast lead incident where uh, William Robinson, who was sure, a tenured... You, you tell about the David Project. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I have a colleague who's, a friend who's, who's researching it and trying to route about it. They have an open website, but the, the sort of the internecine and the, well, what's the right word, the behind the scenes, uh, uh, things that they're doing or, or what we don't know about, the kind of influence that actually, as I mentioned at the press conference, the lawsuit will allow interrogatories and depositions to go ahead and we'll find out other communications that uh, were sent to Weiss and Kennedy and maybe other board of trustees as opposed to just whatever got out in the FO FOIAs. Sorry for uh, no particular question, <laughs> but uh, somebody jump up. Well, the David Project is a, um, a nonprofit based in Boston whose mission, if you look them up on the website, their website, you'll see that this is a, a, a public uh, mission, is to shape the discussion of Israel and Palestine, of Israel really, on college campuses. So this very thing that we're talking about is their project. And they're very clear about what sorts of critical conversations they want to shut down. And they have very thoughtful strategies about how to do that and talking points. That's terrific, thank you. Um, uh, for those who are in sympathy with their project that um, sound very similar to uh, Chancellor Wise's first statement about the Salida case, um, uh, her comments at the Board of Trustees meeting and what we're hearing out of Nick Dirks in, um, at the University of California, Berkeley and a number of other uh, university executives. So those talking points are getting traction. I don't have evidence for those of you who want to push the point it, precisely that that the David Project's talking points were in the hands of Chancellor Wise and that's what caused her to say the things she did. But what they've done is become very effective in creating a plausible rhetoric to understand how criticism of Israel or criticism or comments like Professor Salaitis, as uh, Professor Warrior has just described them, and his own views, um, seem anti-Semitic. And um, it's just shocking that that then gets um, mobilized through a rhetoric of civility. Um, but it's, uh, the, the turn to anti-Semitism was something they tried for some time, particularly at Columbia, where they went after a number of our faculty, um, both the David Project and Campus Watch. 
So I used to have members of Campus Watch in my classes, taping my classes. And then they would be critiqued. And as you all know, there are now lists of faculty who are dangerous. So students, Jewish students are on notice, don't take these classes, classes by these professors, because they, are, they, they hate Jewish students, which of course is not true. Um, uh, and, but they've, they've stopped that monitoring of our classrooms and instead infused the university with a, with a rhetoric of civility in ways that are a little bit harder. At least we have to change our, tra our tactics, I think, to address them. Uh, hi. Uh, I was sort of interested in if there's any comments on how some of these groups seem to be doing legislation by lawsuit. So one of the articles that I've read about the Salada case was saying, oh, is there a, a Palestinian exception to the First Amendment? Um, this seems like the same thing that they've been doing with reproductive rights, where there is a um, anti-abortion exception to assault, because any time the, the, the same sort of thing is happening. Uh, they try, the police try and stop people from assaulting someone, which is yelling, not touching, just yelling. That's assault, that's illegal. But if the, you, your police arrest you, then there's the lawsuit monster comes to the town, and so they won't enforce it. And now they're trying to do the same thing and it, with um, Palestinians saying, standing up, there's a Second Amendment, no, I mean, there's a First Amendment exception, and there's a lot of other ones like the war on drugs is, the whole Bill of Rights is an exception, but I'd like comments, that's it. <laughs> that wasn't the friendliest portrayal of what lawyers do that I've heard, but, <laughs> but it's, it was quite accurate in many respects. Um, we call those sorts of lawsuits slap suits, so they actually have a term. And they were, they were developed a number of years ago um, uh, in response to union organizing. Corporations would file a lawsuit, a slap suit against a union um, in order to redirect their resources from union organizing to defending the lawsuit. Um, and that's what we're doing here, or is attempted to be done here, is that we're talking about academic freedom, we're not talking about Palestinian sovereignty and the kinds of issues that, uh, that arise in Professor Salida's work. So I want to thank Iman for, um, for, for talking about Palestinians and Palestine and, and bringing our attention back to really what the, what the core problem is that we have been distracted from by virtue of a, a slap suit brought by, or slap like strategy brought by the opponents of this kind of conversation. So we need to educate ourselves on on the First Amendment law, and then we need to go back to the business of talking about the stuff they don't want us to talk about. Um, I'm curious to know what you think are the best steps that we can take at, at the University of Illinois to either reverse, if possible. What's it going to take, I think, to, to make real change? I'm interested in the tactics that we need to, to take um, that's, that's gonna make the change. I'm really concerned um, about what's happening across the country, but I'm here at the University of Illinois and I wanna know what we can do here to make sure that this in this particular instance, things are righted, but also that it doesn't open the floodgates for more and more and more instances. If it indeed it was donor influence that created this, I don't know, but I'm concerned. I think the University Foundation meeting of donors is happening this weekend, and I'm curious to see what kind of big donations come through um, and what that means. But anyway, do you have any ideas of, of what it's going to take tactics and things that we can do here in this community. Maybe I can.
can say a couple of uh, things. Uh, as I said, I'm referring again to the, the group of uh, people. Uh, or I see Vince. Vince, you do you want to talk about what we have been discussing uh, yes, last night at the meeting? I snooze a little bit through the meeting, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but there's a couple of things that you know that we're trying to do. It's like right now, the, of course, there's the Saritas team. You know, the, there's a sort of like uh, we're in kind of a a climate of uncertainty in terms of the, the legal action, you know, so we, we're waiting to, to see what uh, satellite side going to do. Uh, but to answer to your questions, I think, you know, we have some kind of like instances of governance on this campus. Are they shared? We thought they were. Um, so, for example, next Monday we have like a, the faculty senate is meeting. So we're trying to invade massively the faculty on this campus to go to the faculty senate because I'm sorry our senate is a bit depressing right now so let's put it this way so we need to show up and say that we want them to take a, a, to not comply with the administration but really seriously trying to do some stuff um, and so to sort of like force them to discuss the, sort of the case what they concretely try to do instead of just uh, giving more power to the chancellor to actually overturn decisions around tenure and hiring. So this is one of the few steps. But you know, at this point, I think what's happening right now, we're trying to see what are the different venues. There's also the LAS College. Uh, there's also the, the Town Hall. There's a, the series of events that are happening. But I think what is very important that we convey as a message is that you know, that as faculty, as students, as staff, but it's mostly, I think, right now, faculty and students, that we, we will not give up and we will really force them to be accountable. And what does it mean? Um, you know, it can mean many things. One of the things that is very depressing right now is there's a president search and they keep announcing that we're going to have a new president in November. Um, so, um, you know, we know. 95% who's going to be the next president, we have a clear sense that it's like this a scenario in, in, in the mix. Um, so the, the, the thing is like, you know, we have to make sure that we can go to the place where faculty has a vo have, have a voice. And this is like in the short term. So I don't know what's the next step because the, the, the idea of organizing is also very, very difficult on campus. There's also the CFA, the Campus uh, Faculty Association that is doing some work. Um, But if I want to be honest, I think we have to intervene as, as many levels as we can. I think we cannot say there's one voice, there's one group, there's one constituency. I think every single like places we can, students and also faculty have to, to sort of like keep pushing. And we have to basically get together, even we, we don't need to agree on everything, but we need to have a, a, a same goal. And I think that's for me, that would be the, I'm sorry to not be more concrete, but as I said, for the faculty who are in, in, in the audience tonight, next Monday at three o'clock is the faculty uh, Senate committee, and it's really, really important that you show up. Quickly, I think that uh, based on um, Catherine Frankie's example, I think that we all need to adopt the uh, the model of being the uncivil faculty members and be willing to to engage in a in a level of incivility with colleagues who disagree with us uh, in fighting for in fighting for the university and the ideals that we have as faculty members. If we're fighting for academic freedom, we're not fighting for civility. We're fighting for we're fighting for our rights to to be scholars in the way that we define scholarship. We're fighting for the rights of our students to learn the things that we believe that they need to learn. Uh, for our rights as scholars to, to, to uh, research in the ways that, that we think will advance knowledge. And I think that if that put, pits us against people who see things differently than us, which it does, then I think it means that we have to be willing to stand up for those things that we believe in. There is, a, there is an attitude among some people on our campus that just says that they get along fine with other people and that, that things have been going along fine and that they like the way things, they like things the way that they are. And I think that sometimes we just have to say to ourselves, you know what, some of us are not really getting along as well at this point with all of that and we need to just move to the next stage of it. It doesn't mean that everything has to be just a shouting match, but it doesn't mean that everything has to be, as I said, to people before Stephen's appointment became a, um, 
imperiled. I said about my first conversations with Chancellor Wise, I said, she went all Scarlett O'Hara on me. And it seemed like everything had to be very nice and we had to be very nice to each other. And I couldn't understand what she was saying because she wouldn't specify what exactly was wrong with what Stephen said. She just told me that it was unacceptable. She wouldn't tell me what was unacceptable about it, but she told me that it just wasn't acceptable. Well, I think we need to be, we need to be willing to really get down and concrete about those things and ask people what exactly it is that they believe in, because it sounds to me, to me more and more that we know what we believe in and we need to stand up for it. curious how many of you are students. Oh, cool. First of all, I want to thank our student panelists for really putting themselves out. Um, was, we have tenure. They don't. They're going, and as graduate students, they're, it was, right, citizenship is a different kind of tenure. Right? <laughs> Never mind sovereignty. Um, uh, but your speaking out on these issues puts you at risk in a different way than it does us, and I just want to acknowledge how, not courageous, but brave <laughs> <laughs> that is. But in terms of what we can do, um, I, it's, this isn't just something for the faculty to lament, uh, and I know that not all of, that none of us have, have urged that, but I want to enfranchise and invite the students to do even more because what the Board of Trustees did is a real insult to you. It sends a mess, because you were the reason protecting you and your sensibilities and your incapacity to critically engage an idea that you might find troubling or intriguing, but as they set it up, troubling and insulting, and feel disempowered and disabled in a, and unable to learn is an insulting message. So there's a student at Columbia who um, is, has come up with, I think, an, an incredible tactic for challenging something she's very upset about at Columbia, which is sexual violence on campus and how poorly our institution has addressed it. And she is carrying around a mattress all over campus. And the reason you all know about this is because it's such a great tactic. It's been in the media, and now other students are helping her carry that, can that mattress to class. So it's now becoming a collective enterprise. And she sits in class with her mattress to, sh to, to both symbolize the weight of what has happened to her, but also the inability or the unwillingness of the university to deal with it. I think that there's not a presence on the level of a mattress, but an absence that you all have been um, burdened with the absence of a particular kind of voice and the absence of a kind of respect for your intellectual capacities and integrity. And I would challenge you as students to come up with a similar tactic. Carry it around with you to class. Confront your professors. When they ask a hard question, I don't know, I just, you know, I need to be protected from that hard question. <laughs> something. Um, and something that will get the media get their attention that will then come back to the chancellor. So I, I just want to, uh, I'd love to think with you about it, but you guys are so creative and hipper than I am. <laughs> um, but I'm inspired by this young woman, even though there's also a sex panic that's accompanying this <laughs> attention to sexual violence on campuses that is complicated. I do think that's a terrific kind of form of performance art. So, so I have just one really quick legal question. 
what is what is sort of the the status of uh, the rubber stamping that the Board of Trustees uh, were supposed to to do for Professor Salida to sort of allow him? How does that complicate sort of the legal landscape that he's on? Does it complicate it at all? The 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 idea that he had to sort of uh, uh, have his his um, appointment rubber stamped by the Board of Trustees before he could officially come onto campus. I mean, is that going to is that going to complicate his his legal defense? Uh, will it complicate it? I don't, I don't think so, but it will be raised. If I were the lawyer for the university, I'd say we never made him an offer. There was no contract until it had been formally approved by the Board of Trustees, and that is often the case in most universities. Um, uh, you do have an internal process that's been subverted that I know many of you are working on the issue of faculty governance and how the Board of Trustees could jump in at the last minute having not read any of his work and reject a, um, a recommendation that's gone through the proper channels. But that's not really um, Stephen's claim uh, so much as, as all of yours. Um, but the university will claim that there was no contract and that's why I was referring to promissory estoppel, um, which is a legal principle that if you make representations on which someone then relies to their detriment, quit your tenured job, your wife quit her tenured job, sell your house, move, and you're led along that you have a contract and then they say, oh no, <laughs> we don't have a formal contract. The law as a sort of matter of fairness will say, no, you can't walk away at that point. Um, particularly when um, people of authority in the university have said to you that it's just a rubber stamp, don't worry, pack the moving truck. So that will be a, an argument that will be made, but Illinois law is pretty clear that that's not good enough. Um, this question follows up on something we just briefly touched upon, and perhaps Professor Rothenberg and Professor Frankie could answer this. Um, one of the former faculty members of your department defended the university's non-hiring and denial of academic freedom to Stephen because he was not actually employed by the university. Therefore, he had no rights to academic freedom from the University of Illinois. So this raises an interesting question, to whom does the University of Illinois owe academic freedom to? know who you're talking about. He doesn't speak for us. Uh, he doesn't speak for the English department. But the broader question. But the, <laughs> as my colleague, I mean, I think this goes to the, the previous question, really. I mean, I, th I think it's, it's, you know, as I understand it, as Catherine just explained it, he was essentially hired, and therefore he certainly has the academic freedom that we would all expect to have. So I guess I'm not quite sure I understand what the force of the question is, other than I'm happy to, uh, to announce my disagreement with my colleague and former friend. Let me extend it, for example. <laughs> Just Let me, one oh. second. <laughs> academic freedom is a value. It's not a legal principle. So you can't sue that your academic freedom has been infringed. But how many of you pay taxes in the state of Illinois? Right? You are injured by paying for a university that doesn't respect the principles for which it's set up. Right? You have a university that is funded with public money, exclusively, or largely, I'm sure there are private grants that come in too. Okay, exclusively, bake sales, anything? Or, um, that has a mission that includes, I'm sure, something that says something about a, you know, a robust intellectual environment and the pursuit of truth and challenges to truth and all that. So you're getting, it's a, if, if we allowed taxpayer suits in this country, which we don't, you, you would be the, the, the taxpayers of Illinois would be the ones injured for the violation of academic freedom principles on campus. The Salida's legal claim, his spiritual claim is academic freedom. His, his legal claim is a, is a constitutional one and a contract based claim, and that applies to whether you're an employee or you're an applicant. So if you're otherwise qualified for the job, which he amply was, more than amply was, 
Um, and the reason you were not hired was because of your race, was because of your religion, or was because of your political speech. That's a violation of the Constitution. So you don't have to be an existing employee to make a constitutional claim. On that note, uh, the evening would have to end, but of course the conversation and the fight still continues. We'd like to thank Catherine Frankie. Please.